Since you guys really seem to enjoy my study on the Reti Endgame, I decided to follow up on that video with a practical example that really illustrates this concept. Now, if you didn't see that video already, I'm going to link it in the description below. Please check that one out because in this video, I'm not really going to explain every single little detail because I feel like it's just going to repeat the same information. So again, if you haven't seen that first video, make sure to watch it before you check this one out. But let's dive into this one. Alright, now in this position, it's White's turn to play and, believe it or not, draw the game. Now if you want to challenge yourself, I do invite you to pause the video right here, see if you can figure the puzzle out for yourself. But if not, let's get right into it. What should White play here? Now, should they try to stop all the pawns, or should they defend their own pawn? If you still remember from the last video, the key element to drawing the game is to create multiple threats. Now White needs to make moves that both attack the pawn while also defending their own. So, in this position, they should do the same thing. The black pawns are going down, and the white pawn is going up. I don't know if I should really mention that or not. So, the first move for white is pretty natural, I think. It's king to g6. It places themselves right in the center of the battle. So from here, black has three options. Push the h pawn, push the f pawn, or move the king over here to b6, attacking the pawn. Let's look at each of them, starting with the h-pawn push. Now how would white respond here? If you said to capture the pawn, unfortunately, that's a losing move for white. Black moves his king to b6, white moves the king to g6. Black takes, white takes the g-pawn, but sadly, the f-pawn can make it to the promotion square without the king being able to reach it. So, why was capturing that pawn a bad move? Well because white committed too early to one plan, which was capturing the pawn. Now would you believe me if I said that white can ignore that pawn push, for now, and instead capture the g-pawn over here and still draw the game? Now you don't believe me? Alright, let me prove you wrong. Now the white king takes on g7, black pushes his pawn to h4, and then our king takes on f6. From now on, white is going to respond to what black plays. If black moves the pawn to h3, White can no longer catch the pawn, so they're going to have to go defend their own pawn. Black moves pawn to h3. White king to e6. Pawn to h2. White pawn to c7. If black promotes, white promotes as well. Now if black plays king to b7, white will respond accordingly and play king to d7 and promote next turn. But what if black doesn't push the pawn and instead goes after our pawn with king to b6? Again, our golden rule, don't commit too early to a single plan. We see that in this position, white can't reach either the black pawn or his own pawn, but by playing king to e5, they can keep both options available while gaining a tempo. Now, if black captures the pawn, white is going to play king to f4, going after black's very last pawn. But if black moves his pawn to h3, now, White is not going to get there in time to reach the pawn, so they would have to shift their focus on defense and play king to d6. Black moves pawn to h2, white moves pawn to c7, and they both promote. Okay, so we see how white should deal with the h-pawn push, but what about black's move to f5? Would white apply the same strategy, or would they take the pawn instead? Well, sadly, if you take the pawn, once again it's going to be a loss. Even if the king is closer now to his own pawn, it's still not going to be enough to draw the game. Now it's not enough to draw the game because black would play king to b6, and we can see how he would capture our pawn the next turn, and we won't get there in time to stop that. But you might be wondering, white can still get there in time to catch those pawns as we saw in our other examples. What drastically changed in this position that now the black king doesn't need to worry about guarding that white pawn from promoting? and now he can come help his own pawn promote. Well, king to f5 by white is not met with pawn to h5 by black. Instead, black is going to play king to d6, king to g6, and then king to e6. White can't capture the g-pawn here because he wouldn't be able to stop the h-pawn, so the only move available is h5. Black is going to move his king closer to his pawns by moving it to f5. And now, with him protecting the g-pawn, he can easily promote. But, what if white would try to move to g4 instead of g6? Now, unfortunately, it ends with the same result. 
Black moves his king to e6, we move to g3. Black pawn to g5, white king to g4, king to e5. And again, white isn't able to go after that h pawn because he's not going to get there in time to stop the g pawn anymore. Okay, so even if white would try to go after that pawn immediately by playing g6 instead of e6, this is only going to lead to the same result because if white captures the g7 pawn, he's not going to get there in time to stop the h pawn. So, do you see how important that pawn is for white? It keeps the black king distracted while the white king can go ahead and clear the board. Now here, white is going to continue to apply the same tactical pattern and take the pawn on g7. Once more, black has three choices. Push the h pawn, push the f pawn, or move the king to b6. Now, if he would continue to push that f pawn, white's going to respond with f6, keeping his options still very open. If black decides to go with f3, white is going to shift to defense. One key element here that wasn't possible for black in the previous video is that white has to be careful when promoting his pawn. If the king moves to e6, here black would play king to b6. Black sets a little trap, and you've got to be careful not to fall into it. Now can you see what the trap is just by looking at the board? If white decides to move his king to d7, he's going to straight up lose the game, even if he can promote his pawn as well. Now why is that? Well, black moves pawn to f2, and white moves his pawn to c7. Black promotes, white promotes. Seems like a pretty even game. However, black has this beautiful skewer with queen to f5, which forces a queen trade, and white can't show up in time to stop black's final pawn. Now instead, in this situation, white is going to have to play king to d6. Black responds pawn to f2. We play pawn to c7. If the black king moves to b7, we can now move to d7, because when we promote, we're going to do it with a check. Even if black is a pawn up, we're just going to continuously check black until a draw is achieved. But what if black moves the h pawn instead? White's pattern is going to remain the same. King moves to f6, black moves the pawn to h4. White king takes on f5, and again, white is going to respond according to what black does. So if black moves his king to b6, white moves to g4. If black moves pawn to h3, White moves king to e6. In case he's going to push the f pawn instead of the h pawn, seeing that he has no chance of getting to that pawn, white is going to go into defense mode once more with king to e7. Black moves king to b6, white king to d7. Black pawn to f3, white moves to c7, and black to f2. And it ends in the same result with both of them promoting. A quick note, however, in this position, if black decides to push the f pawn instead of moving his king to b6, this is actually going to be a major blunder that would lose the game for black. Black moves pawn to f3, we move to c7, black moves to f2, and now white is going to promote with a check, gaining the tempo needed to stop black from promoting completely. And let me show you the last possible variation here, where the black king moves to b6. White then moves to f6, black captures, white captures on f5, black moves his pawn to h5, we move our king to g5, and white is going to capture the next move. So we see how white should deal with the pawn push. But what does he need to do if black decides to go after our pawn? Now from my point of view, this variation is the easiest, especially since we've already gone over the other two options. White takes g7, and no matter what black does, white is going to move to f6. Black captures, king takes back on f6. Black moves to h5, king g5, and then white would draw the game. Black pawn to h5, again, king takes on f6. If black captures, we have the same position as before. Now, if black pawn moves to h4, we have the same position as the previous video. White needs to play king to e5 to keep creating multiple threats. If black captures, he's going to go after the h-pawn, and if the h-pawn advances, white is going to go and defend his own pawn. And finally, what if the f-pawn pushes? White would still play f6, and depending on what black plays, he's going to respond accordingly once again. 
Black moves his pawn to f4. White moves king to e5. Multiple threats. Black captures. White captures. Black moves to f3. White is going to shift to defense. Black moves to h5. White takes on f4 and goes after the h pawn the next turn. So I hope I covered all of the main lines here. Some of them I didn't follow through until the end because it's really the same pattern over and over again. And I don't want to make this video any longer than it really needs to be. So if you haven't already, I truly recommend you go check out our first video on the Reti Endgame study for a better understanding for the theory that we applied here. And once you check that one out, you'll definitely understand this video a little bit better. Keep practicing and have a great one.